know me. I was one of the early founders of the left radical women's liberation movement in the 1960s. Yes. I want to be. <laughs> oh, by the way, um, I'm going to ask Jaime has a um, object of mine, or someone does. Oh, you've already passed it around. Oh, okay. You will understand what I'm going to be talking about that. So it's a book. Oops. There it is. Okay, it will come to you eventually. Okay, I can't see now. <laughs> okay. So um, at that time, when I um, became a radical, raving feminist, I was also already an avowed Marxist, anti-imperialist, and Vietnam War and anti-apartheid activist. When, in 1967, I realized the necessity for women's liberation if there ever was to be a socialist revolution in the United States. So the next few years I organized with women's liberation in the Northeast and in the South, based in New Orleans, and was on a constant campus lecture tour, returning to the Bay Area in 1973. And in the wake of the over two months Wounded Knee occupation, I joined the Bay Area American Indian Movement, AIM chapter, working with the defense of the Wounded Knee defendants. So in 1974, AIM founded the International Indian Treaty Council at a gathering at Standing Rock Reservation in South Dakota, attended by more than 5,000 indigenous representatives from 98 indigenous nations of the Western Hemisphere. The mandate of the Treaty Council was to take the 1848 Sioux Treaty to the United Nations for verification, as well as all other treaties and agreements between indigenous nations and colonizing powers. The founding manifesto of the Treaty Council was titled Declaration of Continuing Independence denouncing U.S. imperialism and colonialism and asserting its solidarity with self-determination of all colonized peoples, uh, naming specifically Puerto Rico. The year before, in 1973, the socialist government in Chile was crushed by a military coup fomented by the United States. The Mapuche indigenous people had made great gains in the restitution and self, uh, of their land and self-rule during the three years of the Allende government and were repressed violently after the coup, driving nearly all of their leaders and militants into political exile all over the world. So, and some of them here, but most of them in Europe. So from the beginning, several Mapuche leaders were essential to the work of the Treaty Council and the international work of indigenous peoples. In 1976, I began working with the Treaty Council on setting up and staffing a San Francisco Treaty Office, Treaty Council Office, and co-editing a newsletter which was published by Fitz Printing. Everyone remember? Anyone remember Fitz Printing? <laughs> um, the collective founded by um, Hilton Obensinger, his printing press on Valencia, where we also shared space and worked in solidarity with the KDP. And that was a Filipino, the anti-imperialist Filipino resistance group. Indigenous Igaro were part of the international work from the very beginning. In fact, an Igorot woman, Vicky Tali Corpus, is the United Nations Special Rapporteur uh, on the rights of indigenous peoples. The immediate goal of, treaty, of the Treaty Council was to gain United Nations acknowledgement of treaties. And thanks to the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, WILF, which was a major non-governmental organization that held consultative status with the UN. A conference was set for September 1977 to be held in Geneva, Switzerland offices of the United Nations. During the two years leading up to the Geneva Conference, the Treaty Council 
office here in San Francisco, organized massive gatherings and encampments on native land preparing for the UN conference. Through contacts in the United Nations, international guests always included representatives of African liberation movements and of course Puerto Rican um, Socialist Party representatives. Although the main Treaty Council office was in New York near UN headquarters, our office in San Francisco was the organizing center for the conference. The Treaty Council organized the Native American Solidarity Committee here in San Francisco. Was anyone here a, mem a member of that at the time? Remember? It was mostly, um, primarily made up of feminist and queer anti-imperialist activists. Likewise, the Treaty Council organizing group was composed of mostly Native women. The president of the 1977 UN conference in Geneva was Edith Ballantyne, a lifelong feminist and anti-imperialist and secretary general of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Who in opening the conference remarked on the strong women's presence among the hundred native delegates and the Treaty Council staff. Among the participants in the conference were the African National Congress of South Africa, the Namibian SWAPO, and the Palestine Liberation Organization. Edith Ballantyne, now in her 80s, or her 90s, remains to this day a mentor to the international indigenous work. So a working group on the rights of indigenous people convened in 1982 in the UN Human Rights Commission with exiled Kichi Mayan leader Rigoberta Menchu Tun, saw on the side of the building, testifying to genocide against the Kichi Mayan people in the Guatemalan highlands. Rigoberta won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1992, announced on October 12th the 500-year anniversary of the beginning of European overseas colonialism with the arrival of Columbus. That year, the UN declared the first UN year for indigenous people, at the end of which a decade for indigenous peoples began and a second decade to follow, culminating in the United Nations General Assembly Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in 2007 the beginning of the international treaty process and representation um, in the General Assembly of the UN. So the book that's going around, The Great Sioux Nation, is still up there. This is a book I assembled from a wounded knee hearing that took place in December 1974. There was a wounded knee hearing of 300 uh, defendants. It was a, a motion to dismiss of 300. Um, the uh, native and non-native defendants. It was co-published in another feminist anti-imperialist connection. It was co-published in 1977 by the Treaty Council with Moon Books, a San Francisco feminist press founded by the great feminist Annie Mander, the late Annie, Ma uh, Annie Mander, and Anne Kent Rush, with royalties going to the Treaty Council. It sold 30,000 copies before Moon Press shut down in 1979. There are photographs throughout the book, uh, you'll see, that uh, sort of give you a sense of all, all of this activity I'm talking about. So I'll finish with, I'm grateful to Diana Block and others who organized the panel on this theme. It is important to remember what is possible because it happened here in the Bay Area. A vibrant feminist, anti-imperialist solidarity movement that had a steady Amilcar Cabral of, the, of Guinea Bissau. National liberation movements uh, throughout the world and learning from the women of other anti-Portuguese revolutionaries of Angola, Mozambique, as we had from Vietnamese women revolutionaries. And in the late 70s and through the 80s, we supported liberation movements in Central America and the Caribbean. Things got very tough in the midst of deindustrialization 
the imposition of neoliberalism and austerity, and the regimes of Reagan and Thatcher. Most young people today have no memory or knowledge of the possibilities for liberation that we experienced and must recreate in our present.